The purpose of this video is to cover applications of the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. I'll start off with a comment. The model we are using in these videos and in the text is a version of a widely used macroeconomic model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. There are many versions of this model, depending on the application, in other words, what exactly we're trying to explain. Since this course is about financial markets and institutions, with an emphasis on banking and the Fed, built into the model we're looking at is the dynamic response of the Fed to inflation. In a more general macroeconomic course, that dynamic response is not built into the model. Nevertheless, the model can be used to explore Federal Reserve action. So my point here is that there are many versions of the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model, and once you get familiar with the model we're using and exploring in this course, the other versions will not be that difficult to understand. That said, there will be differences in assumptions, and sometimes those differences will be very subtle. Next, we'll cover COVID and the impact it had on the economy and what the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government are doing to try to combat the economic effects of COVID-19. Then we'll talk about stagflation and the issues associated with stagflation. And then we'll look at central bankers' biggest fear. So now let's use the model that we developed and see if we can explain the pandemic and the effects and then the remedies that are being used right now to try to get us back to full employment, various fiscal and monetary policies. Keep in mind that the model is designed to be very generic, and the only real slant it has, the only real specific aspect to this model is it has the dynamic aspect of the Federal Reserve responding to inflation. But you know, there really wasn't an inflation problem when we got hit with the coronavirus. Nobody was expecting inflation to go up. So that part of the model is not really used in this situation. The Fed did not respond to inflation when it conducted extensive monetary policy actions to try to reduce the effect of the pandemic. Okay, with that said, the model is fairly good at explaining what happened. So let's see what happened. First of all, notice that I've drawn this model out beforehand, and I drew it out very carefully. I wanted to get some precision in it. And really, the precision that I wanted was around inflation. So if you look on the left-hand side there on the inflation axis, I got 2% zero and minus 2% with some fine lines there. So let me explain why I did that. First off, in January of 2020, we started out at equilibrium 0.1. We have our standard dynamic demand curve, full employment, and a short-run aggregate supply curve. We're in equilibrium. Then the next thing is the pandemic hits, and two things move off to the left simultaneously. The demand curve shifted to the left, and the short-run aggregate supply curve shifted to the left. Now let's see why. Well, with the demand curve, Basically, you had social distancing was imposed, and various states shut down and imposed restrictions on what we could do. So that caused a collapse of the airline industry for the most part. Not, to not a total collapse, but a huge reduction in the volume of flights. And the same with the hotel industry. The number of bookings are down really low. Obviously, people stopped going to restaurants, so demand dropped off there. And I don't need to tell you all the rest. You're fully aware of that. All of those things shifted the dynamic aggregate demand curve to the left. What caused the short-run aggregate supply curve to shift up and to the left? Well, with social distancing orders imposed, businesses were forced to let go of workers. They reduced the volume of activity that they were doing. And many just closed. All of that you can think of as a shift left in the short run aggregate supply curve. But if you notice carefully in the picture that I drew, I put a little up arrow. And let me give you an example of why I think there was a little bit of upward movement, which meant that input costs went up. It wasn't that there was expected inflation on an aggregate basis going up there. It's that input costs went up in some cases. And let me give you an example of the restaurant industry. Because of social distancing, the number of tables that are in 
a restaurant were reduced significantly. And not only that, but workers were forced to social distance also. So there were less workers in the kitchen. There was less workers on the dining room floor. And there was less workers manning cash registers and other things in the restaurant. So that caused costs to go up. You know, businesses were used to operating at a certain capacity. Now you have to shrink that capacity significantly. It's going to cause some upward pressure on their costs. Also what hit them was some municipalities increased the minimum wage during the pandemic, which was a little odd to me that they were doing that because, as you know, when prices go up and, and wages are the price of labor, you tend to have a reduction in the consumption or demand for a particular item. Well, if employers have to pay more for their workers, then that's probably going to cause a, a reduction in employment. In other words, a little more unemployment. To me, that just compounded things worse. You don't want to raise costs to businesses when you're way left of full employment. But in any case, that's what happened. The workers that actually get that minimum wage yeah, they'll, they'll benefit from it, but there's going to be people that don't get a job because of it. So that also caused the short-run aggregate supply curve to shift upward. So now let's look at what actually happened in terms of inflation. So you know we have to be to the left of full employment, right? So we can't be anywhere right of the full employment line here. And Overall, inflation did not go up on an aggregate basis. Inflation was not up here. Inflation actually fell. So if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers on the CPI, they're the ones that produce the consumer price index. For the month of April, we had deflation. In other words, negative inflation of about 1%. And that's where I have that arrow there saying April 2020. We had a significant shift out left and we fell, our price level fell to about negative 1%. We started out with an inflation rate of ballpark, just under 2%, where I have the number one there, where we started out in equilibrium. So that was January and February. So by April of 2020, we had an unemployment rate of about 15%. So that gap right here at the dot where it says April 20th, the arrow pointing there, all the way to the full employment line, that gap is a recessionary gap, right? And that represents about 15% unemployment. So I should be careful in my wording here. The unemployment rate was 15%, but remember when we have full employment and we're at YP potential, there's always about 3% unemployment or so in a natural long run economy. So really that distance is about 12% or so between the long run potential and that dot at the April 20th arrow. So now it's early 2021 as I'm talking to you in this video. And what's happened since is the unemployment rate now has been chopped down to about half of what it was before. The unemployment rate now is about 8%, which means that gap represents about 5% unemployment. And the inflation rate is back up in the positive territory. So now we're basically in this black oval that I have drawn here. We're somewhere around there. And so now the question that I pose is, well, how did we get there? How did we get, we got from, we know how we got from point one to this April 2020 dot here because of the pandemic, but how did we move so far to the right and up a bit in a matter of like nine months? Well, here's what happened. Now, one thing that caused that move to the right was PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program that was implemented. PPP is kind of like a blend between fiscal and monetary policy. PPP was approved by Congress in March of 2020 and was designed to help small businesses that lacked access to credit during COVID. The goal was to maintain employment and wages to pre-pandemic levels. So the SBA, the Small Business Association oversaw the administration of the program and banks administered the disbursement of the money and collected fees. And what's interesting about the administration of the loans is the borrower's ability to repay the loan is not a factor in determining eligibility. 
which is interesting. The loans are guaranteed by the SBA, the Small Business Association. So when a bank doesn't get repaid, it'll end up getting its money back from the Small Business Administration because they're overseeing the administering of the overall program. Small businesses got the loans to maintain payrolls and to keep workers on. The loans would be forgiven if businesses maintained wage levels and employment of about 75% of the pre-crisis level. That's how it was designed. So what you see here is a massive fiscal and monetary policy reaction that impacted both the supply and the demand curves simultaneously. So that Paycheck Protection Program was designed to increase and maintain employment. So that, that helped shift the short-run aggregate supply curve off to the right a bit towards the oval. And at the same time, it's putting money in the people's pockets so that they could pay their rent, buy food, and just have a standard of living. So that caused the dynamic aggregate demand curve to shift to the right. So the point is we intersect now at this oval, and it's a short run intersection. It's short run because we're not at full employment at this point, and we hope that it's short run, that this doesn't last a long time. And the question then becomes, will this pandemic actually have long-term implications? Will it cause this full employment line to shift left? Eh, probably not, but it may dampen the growth rate in the future of this full employment line. So the full employment line is going to be moving out to the right much slower. And one way to model it is the way I've been showing you all along is I've been showing you, look, we have a business cycle and this time we're way down here significantly. And the question is, will that cause this full employment potential to flatten out. It was on trajectory to continue to go up if we, if we didn't get hit by the pandemic. So now the question is, will it do this? Hopefully it's not going to do this. If it does, if it goes this way, it's going to cause the, the full employment line, the long run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. This will cause it to stay constant where it is and this will cause it to go to the right slowly. So the big question is, will there be permanent and lasting effects on the aggregate economy? No doubt there's going to be lasting effects in certain industries. Without a doubt, there will be lasting effects. But on an aggregate level, it'll be interesting to see when the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, comes out with its next projection for potential GDP. When I first heard about the PPP program, I was intrigued because I knew right away that there would be implications for both the supply and the demand curves. In the past, what's happened when we went into financial crisis mode, the government would, would pull out a laundry list of major infrastructure projects that they wanted done. And, well, that would be big, that would be G government expenditures going up dramatically. And then, well, government expenditures, and then you'd have to supply for, for example, if you wanted to have a, if you wanted to rebuild the nation's roads and bridges, that would increase demand, the G would go up. And then there was, you know, supply would follow that. But the problem with those actions were, it took years in some cases. You just don't get a giant project out to rebuild the nation's roads and bridges and have it started the next day. It takes a lot of planning. And the problem with that is by the time it unfolds and it actually comes into being, we're on a rebound anyway. So it just makes things worse. And so what happens is we would come up like this, naturally things would rebound and things would rebound because we're in a recession and prices would prices and wages would tend to soften, you know, that self-correcting mechanism we talked about. And we'd be here. And we'd start to rebound and have some growth. And then all of a sudden, those construction projects would kick in. And it would just make inflation even worse. We'd be way up here. And that's what's happened in the past. Instead of being counter-cyclical, counter-cyclical meaning reduce this waviness of this, this line that we have here, 
it actually increased the volatility of the line, making things worse. So the Paycheck Protection Program was kind of cool because it, it was rolled out very quickly, at least relative to what the government has done in the past. So how does the Federal Reserve fit into the PPP program? The Fed set up a PPP lending facility to provide liquidity to financial institutions that lent money under the Paycheck Protection Program. So what else has the Fed done besides help the federal government with the PPP program? Well, it's purchased billions and billions of dollars of treasury securities, residential mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, and dropped the Fed funds rate to zero. We're now at the zero lower bound again. Before I move on to the next topic in this video, I just want to make some concluding remarks on the Paycheck Protection Program as it stands at this point in time. The act seems to be continuously under revision. I mean, the original documentation goes on for hundreds of pages and makes reference to dozens and dozens of other acts and regulations. It's bewildering to try to keep track of it. And like I said, it seems to be continuously under revision, which makes it really hard to follow and track at this point. We won't know the full effects on aggregate demand and aggregate supply until the dust settles, probably several years after the fact. The next topic I want to cover is stagflation. But before I actually get into the model of stagflation, let's look at what normally happens with a typical aggregate demand shock. So we start out at point one, and let's say we have a positive demand shock. For some reason, you know, optimism increases, investment consumption increases, the dynamic aggregate demand curve shifts out to the right. So we go from point one, we move up this short run aggregate supply curve because of sticky wages, and we end up at point two. If you can't read that, that's point two there. So we're now at point two, and there's a self-correcting mechanism involved. And there's two parts to it. One is we have adaptive expectations, and if we see that prices have gone up, then we're going to forecast and expect higher inflation, right? That's going to shift this curve up to the left and will that be at point three here. That self-correcting mechanism is in a sense reinforcing. You have adaptive expectations that's going to cause prices to go up and the short run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. And the fact that we're in an inflationary gap in and of itself because we are beyond full employment, that's going to put upward pressure on prices and wages. And so they reinforce and we move up to point three. Now on the flip side, when we have a negative demand shock, the demand curve shifts to the left. We go from point one to point two. Prices have come down. We are in a recessionary gap. And that means there's going to be lower pressure on wages and prices. So with adaptive expectations, this drop in inflation here is going to cause this second leg of movement with lower inflation. And so the supply curve is going to shift this way, down, and we end up at point three. So it's the adaptive ex expectations that go on here, plus the fact that we have this recessionary gap where we know there's going to be downward pressure on prices and wages, and we're going to move that aggregate supply curve to point three. So again, it doesn't matter which side we're on here with the demand shock, we're going to see two reinforcing effects, self-correcting mechanisms, if you will. Adaptive expectations added on the fact that we have an expansionary gap or a recessionary gap, which helps adjust prices. Now, with this background, let's move into what a supply shock looks like. We're going to shock the short run supply curve and move it up or move it down. Let's see the differences. And for that, let me get a new picture here. So now what I have here is a graph where we have the short run aggregate supply curve shifting to the left. So we start in equilibrium, we shift to the left. And that's because of a supply shock. And what do we mean by a supply shock? An example, well, the example that I have in mind is the big oil shocks we had in the 1970s. And you should remember, input prices caused the supply curve to shift up. 
or to the left. So we end up at this point. Now let's see if we can work our way through. How do, how do we get back to this long run equilibrium? Well, let's see. Prices are up, but we know from adaptive expectations. Ooh, we know from adaptive expectations is that once prices go up, we would expect prices to go up again. Ooh, up to here. So we we not only have a recessionary gap that we started with, we end up with an even bigger gap. And what else would we see here? What else would we know? Well, we're in a recessionary gap. When you're in a recessionary gap at this point here, you would expect there to be lower inflation because we're in a recession. Wages would eventually come down and prices would have pressure to come down. So that would be lower inflation and we'd move in this direction. So when we get to this point, two things happen which offset each other. We have pressure for adaptive expectations to cause prices to go up. And then we have a recessionary gap which causes inf inflation to drop and wages to fall. So what happens? Well, it turns out they cancel each other out and you end up here for a while. In other words, you end up in a recessionary gap where there's no real self-correcting mechanism on a net a as a whole. You end up staying at point two, which is problematic. Okay, so that's problematic. Well, we have fiscal and monetary policy. Let's see how that would work. Well, if we're at this point right here, so here's the demand curve at this point too. If we did monetary or fiscal policy and we moved the demand curve out, we get more inflation. Ooh, more inflation with adaptive expectations would probably lead to more inflation, right? So that's a problem. Okay, so what if we cool the economy off to get rid of the inflation? Well, you move the aggregate demand curve down here using fiscal and monetary policy. And what do you get? Well, you get a bigger recessionary gap. Now we're at a recessionary gap that's this big. We do, we're back to lower inflation, which is good, but we get into a, a lot of unemployment. So when we're at this point, at point two, the self-correcting mechanisms kind of offset each other and we become stagnant with inflation, a stagnant economy with inflation. And that's what's happening right here. This situation was compounded in the 1970s by the fact that the Fed, when it increased interest rates, it increased nominal rates, not real rates. What that means is this. The Fed, when it watched inflation go up, it increased nominal rates at the same pace it left the real rate unchanged. And so we got higher inflation and we, we kept real rates constant. It didn't have any dampening effect on the economy to try to lower inflation. So the goal was to lower inflation at the time because inflation was starting to get out of hand. But if you don't change the real interest rate, you don't really do much to the economy. And so the economy kind of spiraled with more and more inflation is what happened. And that's where we got stagflation. So it took quite a long time for us to pull out of that. It wasn't until the 1980s, the early 1980s, under Paul Volcker, that he orchestrated a severe recession with the intention of getting rid of the inflation rate, the high inflation. And it worked, but it took a lot of pain and a lot of unemployment to do it because we had to break the cycle of inflation on top of inflation on top of inflation. So that's a leftward shift, a negative oil supply shock, as we call it, which has you know, a bad implication for the economy. It's hard for us to, to pull out of that. One thing, by the way, that might help is what's called supply-side economics. So supply-side economics says, OK, you're here. Why don't we reduce taxes and make things easier for businesses to expand and lower their costs? Because taxes are an input cost, so to speak. So if you could do that, you can move in this direction. But lowering taxes, especially for, for corporations, you know, has some political issues with it for a lot of people. And so it's not necessarily looked upon as being an easy solution. Now, the question becomes, let's say we start off in equilibrium. We're at this point right here. 
and we have a positive supply shock Whew. down to here. Wow, that's like everything we want. We want we have a strong economy with low inflation. You know, there's nothing wrong with being down here when you have low inflation. So that's really attractive. So you know, we want to stay there if we can. There wouldn't be any much. There wouldn't be any desire to try to manipulate the economy out of that situation. But how do we get there? Well, you could start off at this equilibrium and reduce taxes, as I just said, on corporations and even wages, uh, even income taxes for individuals, because then they're more likely to work. You could also have an increase in labor productivity. You get some really good innovations that come along, the internet, for example, cell phones, GPS systems, and you increase productivity and you move down in this direction. The former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan used to love labor productivity increases because it made his job so much easier. We kept moving in this direction in the late 1990s and that kept inflation at bay and we had a really strong economy. It didn't last though. When the dot-com bubble burst, we ended up with a demand shock that pushed everything to the left. And we went to we went to the left of full employment. Not a whole lot, but we did. We did get some unemployment out of it. So that's the nature of stagflation and positive productivity shocks. Now what I want to do is cover another topic, and that topic is the zero lower bound and what scares central bankers the most. Let's begin our analysis with some numbers using the Fisher equation and the Taylor equation. It'll make things more concrete. So here we have the Fisher equation, I equals the real rate plus the inflation premium. Let's say we start off with a nominal interest rate of 5%, 2% real rate, and an inflation rate of 3%. Now let's say we start to get into slow economic growth. A recession begins, and so inflation starts to come down. Okay? And then what the Fed does in reaction to seeing that cut, that reduction in inflation, starts cutting I, the nominal rate. And then what we do is we plug in R. So this is coming down naturally in the economy. The Fed is reacting by cutting nominal rates. It's cutting it according to the Taylor equation, so I'm being fairly true with this equation, except I'm eliminating, just ignore this for the analysis, it doesn't much matter, that's the inflation. That's the, the output gap. I'm going to ignore that. And so remember the Taylor rule says nominal rate equals the real rate plus an inflation premium plus one half of the difference between the targeted inflation rate and actual inflation. So when inflation changes relative to the target, it's not only a, has a, a half a percent impact here, but there's also implicitly a one here. So any change in inflation has a one and a half coefficient. So the inflation rate drops by 1% here. Notice, I drops by one and a half percent. Inflation drops at 1%, I drops one and a half percent, and so on. So I'm being true to this equation minus the output gap component. Notice here, we're allowing R to change, so that as inflation changes, the Fed changes the nominal interest rate, and the real rate of interest changes. So the Fed is attempting to maneuver the economy in a positive direction. So what do we see from this analysis? We see that inflation is falling, and there gets to be a point where inflation turns to zero. And look what happens. The real rate actually starts to go up. Hmm. I wonder what that means and how to interpret that. Well, let me show you. What's going on here is a monetary policy reaction curve that looks like this. So we have a normal monetary policy reaction curve. When inflation comes down, the real rate drops. But notice what happens in this instance. We drop down to an inflation rate of zero and the real rate starts to actually go up, which is what we're seeing right here. The real rate is actually going up as we go down here. So while it looks like 
the zero inflation rate is what's causing it, and that's where the kink is in the monetary policy reaction curve. The real problem is the fact that we hit the zero lower bound. Nominal interest rates hit zero. They continue at zero even when the inflation rate turns negative. Ooh, so that tells you right away that we're not on a normal part of the monetary policy reaction curve. We're on this negative slope component here. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Well, let's look. This is what it means. It means we have a dynamic aggregate demand curve that's not negatively sloped in all places. It actually has a kink and it's positively sloping. So look what we have. We have a dynamic aggregate demand curve that's normally downward sloping like we're used to seeing. But look what happens. It becomes kinked and it's positive here when we have low inflation. So we're down here with low inflation. Basically, we've got negative inflation at this point. We're coming down here and we actually have a kink in that demand curve. Now, what's the implication of that? Hmm. Well, let me show you. The implication is this. We obviously have to have a short run aggregate supply curve. And we have a long run. We're in a recession, right? That's, so that's the setup here. We're in a recession, which is why prices are falling. But look, if we start off at point one with this short run aggregate supply curve, what's happening? Well, we got two reinforcing mechanisms going on here. One is we're in a recessionary gap, and when we're in a recessionary gap, there's downward pressure on prices. Inflation is going to fall, and expected inflation is likely to fall. So we have two compounding factors that's going to cause the aggregate supply curve to shift down. We got those adaptive expectations. Inflation is falling, so it's likely to fall again. And then we have the fact that we're in a recessionary gap and we're likely to continue to go down. So this is basically a death spiral because as inflation drops, output drops, and there's no self-correcting mechanism to pull us out. We have a compounding mechanism here that's causing us to be in disequilibrium. That's the downward spiral that Japan has felt for like 10 years or more. They were in this spiral. They had really, really low inflation. Then Abe, the prime minister, came along and did everything he could to boost inflation expectations. So he had their central bank do massive bond buying, to try to stimulate the economy, try to set expectations higher. So what happened with that strategy? Well, inflation started to rise above zero. The unemployment rate was reduced, but they still didn't meet their targeted inflation rate. And that's one of the main points here. Once you get into a downward spiral with, with inflation and prices start dropping, it's hard to undo that. It's hard to reverse direction. And so that spiral is what worries central bankers. We don't want to be in this position. It leads to an increase in real interest rates, a downward spiral in the price level, and a continuing recession we never snap back to equilibrium.